Mahesh Natarajan is COO of Ananda. Look, as a, as a healing retreat for now over 20 years, I think we've now absolutely clear about the fact that true healing uh, really requires a journey within. And this is a journey towards self-awareness and spiritual knowledge. And that's what we're really working at. Um, so in answer to this response, and I've heard it articulated so many times today, uh, who am I, who is the true self, uh, where do I seek it? Where do, where do I find this? There's actually a beautiful uh, sutra. Uh, it's, a, it's a yogic system, Sanskrit sutra, which I will quote, which actually responds to this. Uh, it goes, Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam. Yo Veda, all knowledge, Nihitam resides in or is embedded in Guhayam. Guhayam is a series of uh, interlocked caves. Uh, it's a metaphor for the interlocked sheets of the human personality, right? It's the five sheets of the human personality, which we call in the yogic system koshas. And this construct, this structure, is what has come to define literally the way we have thought about our own, the healing journey that we practice at Ananda. And it's really come to define everything that we know of and the way we guide our guests as well. So today I'm, I want to talk about this construct and the structure and hopefully you'll, uh, it's actually a reflection of many, many things that have been said already today, right? So like any concept of self-awareness and discovery, you always start from what is gross, what you can see in front of you, and you work your way towards what is subtle, what you cannot see or what is difficult to see or what is almost something which is unimaginable, right? And that's the process that we'll go through. So think of this as concentric circles, where we're working our way from the outermost circle to the inner, and that's what I'll take you through. So the first sheath is called Annamaya Kosha. They're all called Koshas. The first sheath is called Annamaya Kosha. The Sanskrit word for Anna is food, nourishment, and as this is actually concerning the physical body. And as we all know, our physical body and our physical presence is really food rearranged. Uh, it, all the food that you're consuming and all the elements from the atmosphere, uh, the intelligence from that is actually what is giving you form and function. So the Annamaya Kosha is actually the physical body and this is where Ayurveda is playing such an important part because for those of you who have gone deeper into Ayurveda and there's some of them here today, it really offers one of the most comprehensive blueprints or a user manual in understanding your physical self. So the journey at Ananda is really one where we actually guide people into understanding their own bioenergies or doshas, right? And how do you balance them? And that's the core. And that by itself is a huge topic and it takes a, uh, a real understanding of this framework, but one that you can really use in your life every day. But even more important to, in my mind, in terms of doshas, is also understanding the Ayurvedic concept of dinacharya. Okay, there's gonna be quite a few concepts coming your way today, so just bear with me. The Ayurvedic concept of dinacharya, dina, day, charya is routine, behavior, actions. The challenge in today's day and age is that people are really confused and they're not able to figure out how to connect with their own energy. And this confusion is actually the root cause of so many issues, imbalances, and even disease. So the Ayurvedic concept of dinacharya is how do you live your life in complete, total, and full harmony? How do you understand how your body's inherent circadian rhythms can match with the chronological rhythms of the day, the seasonal rhythms of the year? And how do you marry the two? Because every day is a new day and you can't get it back. So, this concept of dinacharya is actually governing everything. It's got a framework for the entire way you live your life, from the time you wake up, how you wake up, uh, how you cleanse yourselves, how you do an oral cleanse, how you do a nasal cleanse, how you evacuate. Not many people like to think about that, but it's important. Uh, how you apply oil on your body as an abhyanga, how you face north or east and do your morning asanas, how you end the day, how you prepare a ritual for you to go to sleep. Every aspect of this is dinacharya. And you do every aspect 
with a complete consciousness of why this is important. So this is a big part, a lifestyle. The second very important part of Dhanacharya is your diet and the food that you eat for the Annamaya Kosha. Whether you're following a diet which balances your doshas or whether you're fasting, as many of you would know in Ayurveda, the concept of purification at a cellular level is not possible unless the digestive system is completely at rest, which means a system of fasting. And it's not just the food. It's also understanding every morsel that you put inside you. How is your body reacting to it? How do you feel after it? If you're going to feel like all you want to do is just curl up and lounge in a sofa and like do nothing all day, that's probably not the best food for you. If on the other hand, the food is making you feel really agitated or out of balance, that's also not the food for you. So how is it making you feel being aware? And I think somebody said this earlier, it's not just the food that you eat, it's also how you eat it. What are you conscious of when you're eating it? Today, in traditional India, a um, lot of people will actually spend a minute or two meditating before they actually touch what is on their plate. And this is not some kind of esoteric form of meditation. It is just being conscious about everything that has gone on to bring that food on your plate. That transformation that that plant life has had when it comes, who's grown it, who's brought it, how is it on your plate, what is it doing once it goes inside you, what benefit can this food which is digested have on anybody else? It's a complete consciousness awareness of the food that you eat. And the belief is that this kind of awareness changes the way the food behaves when you eat it. So this is Dhinacharya, the art of developing uh, the, your Annamaya Kosha, the first sheath, is all about understanding and following a, a daily and a seasonal routine. It's about understanding your doshas, eating right, the asanas that you do, all of this is Annamaya Kosha. So that's the first sheath. Now we come to the second sheath. The second sheath, the inner sheath, is called Pranamaya Kosha. Prana. And here's where it gets really interesting. So the prana, as you know, is the life force. It's the active force which is kind of connecting and energizing the entire body. Uh, it controls everything. The temperature inside our body, the way the breath breaks down inside your body, uh, the electromagnetic fields, the aura, all of that is pranic. So Swami Niranjan Ananda of the Bihar School, which we follow very closely, he's got a great example uh, of how to describe the pranamaya kosha. So he says, think of uh, when you're driving a car uh, it, with a gear shift, uh, if some of you are still using gear shift cars, you start and you move from neutral to first. From first, you come to neutral and then come to second. Second, neutral and then third. And then onwards till you go fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. Well, in India, with our traffic, you probably don't need more than three gears. <laughs> but uh, the whole idea is that uh, neutral is the analogy for prana, because you need that to activate the other states. Similarly, it is the activation of the pranamaya kosha which allows you to connect with the other states, allows you to activate the physical body, the mental body, the conscious body, the bliss body. All of this comes from the pranamaya kosha. Now, prana is found everywhere. It's found in different layers, some of them more subtle, but the most easy way or the accessible way of reaching prana is through swasa or breath. And that is why there is so much focus on breath, like we were focusing on earlier. Yogis of old time have known that certain types of breath control is what is required for deep regeneration or rejuvenation at the cellular level. And even the brain thinks and functions differently. So we all know uh, pranayama or the rules of breathing as inhalation and exhalation, and that's been practiced in different ways. But if you think about what Patanjali, one of the uh, real authorities on, on, on yoga and, and yogic philosophy has said is, it's actually that space between inhalation and exhalation, what we call the kumbhak, that's what is directing the prana or the life force or the vital force. And when you start accessing that, then you're able to actually calm down what we call the sympathetic nervous system or the flight or fight response and activate the parasympathetic, which is the relaxation response, so powerful. And there's also a, such a strong relationship between emotions and breathing. You know this. If you are feeling angry or agitated, your breath becomes shallow and rushed, right? And if you're looking at a beautiful ocean, immediately your breath becomes all controlled and deep. So the yogis figured that while this relationship is true, the reverse is also true. If you can actually control your breathing, you can control 
your emotions. And then they started speaking about longevity and the relationship of pranayama to longevity or pranamaya kosha to longevity. Because we know in the animal planet, there is an inverse relationship between the number of breaths you take per minute and the longevity of that mammal. So that is why in the yogic system, the phrase in Sanskrit, of course, uh, saying, breathe like a tortoise, live like a king. Because the tortoise only has about three or four breaths per minute. So the, the entire idea of what we're trying to do to access the pranamaya kosha at Ananda is to really take people through different stages of prana. You start pranayama, from starting from the basics, deeper and deeper and deeper, and then you can use elements like mudras, which are hand gestures, or bandhas, which are energy locks, because once you unlock that energy, then again, there's a rush of the flow of energy. So the different ways of doing it, even when you're doing yoga asanas, the concept of awareness and then directing the flow through your breath work is very important. So that is pranayama kosha. Now we come to the third, the next inner sheath, which is called manomaya kosha. And this is actually the crux of this topic, the power of the mind that I wanted to talk to you about today. Manomaya kosha, and this is the mental body. It's different from the way you're looking, thinking about the things today in, the, in pretty much all parts of the world, because we say the mind, assuming that this is some kind of organ or piece which is inside your brain, but the yogic system actually calls it the mental body. There's nothing called the mind in the yogic system. It's the mental body because every cell in every part of the body, according to the yogic system, has intelligence. So manomaya kosha is your memory plus all the intelligence contained in your entire body. You can experience it. When a manomaya kosha is in balance, then you feel confident, you feel aware, you feel connected to yourself, uh, you take responsibility for your thoughts and actions. There is a sense of purpose. You feel inquisitive about, about everything. But when your manomaya kosha, the mental body, is not in balance, the opposite is true. You don't feel confident. You don't feel connected. Your sense of self is either so high that you put everybody else after you, or your sense of self is so low that you always feel weak and insecure. So at Ananda, our understanding and the way we are approaching this is through three very important practices. The first practice to impact the manomaya kosha is what we call pratyahara. Pratyahara is actually an intermediate stage even before you start the process of meditation. It is that stage where you're actually objectively looking at your senses and trying to kind of keep a distance from it. That is pratyahara. There's a beautiful example of the concept of pratyahara. There's an old story. There's a king who had four wild horses and just couldn't tame them, whatever he did. Called people from all over the country they all came, tried to tame it, went away with broken limbs, just could not do it. This one guy comes up and he says, King, I'll take your horses, but you've got to give me a year, and then I'll come back. End of a year, he comes, and these four horses are trotting in a beautiful line, and the king is amazed. He says, how did you do it? And this man says, here's what I did. I took the horses, and for the first three months, I did nothing except be with them every minute of every hour of every day. When they ran on the fields, I ran with them. When they went to the stream and bent down for a drink of water, I drank the water. When they bent down and like started munching on the, on the grass, I pretended to do the same or I would eat something. When they slept, I slept. After some time, the horses started ignoring me. They started thinking of me as some kind of a strange fifth horse. And slowly I was able to get closer and closer and closer and until about Six months later, I was able to put a saddle on one of them. And, and then the stirrups, and then this process continued till one day I was able to actually work with them. And this is the story. That's the concept of pratyahara. If you want to get onto your mind and start galloping from day one, it's never going to happen. Right? The mind's going to call you and entice you. And the moment you try and get on, it's going to throw you off. Pratyahara says, understand the mind, become a friend to the mind. That's what we do in our pratyahara uh, elements, whether we're doing a yoga nidra or ajapa japa or antarmona, these are all techniques and practices. You, you, distractions are always going to be there. You don't try and like, you know, silence them or cut them off. You go to the distractions. You understand the vagaries of the mind. And slowly as you're doing that, the distractions start fading away and you come deeper and deeper. And at that stage, your mind becomes a friend and allows you to develop your intellect 
allows you to reduce the ego or the ahankara, as we call it. And that's where true meditation will start. So this is the first concept, concept of pratyahara. The second is actually mantra meditation. It's one of the most powerful ways of actually working on the manomaya kosha to soothe and calm the obsessive nature of our mind. In fact, the very word mantra comes from the Sanskrit two words, which is mananath, which is the obsessive nature of the mind constantly ruminating on the same thing and not able to escape that, and trayate. Trayate is removing of this obsessive nature. So from these two words came mantra. In the early mornings when your mind is at rest and when you're able to actually practice mantra chanting, the resolve that you have can go very deep down and that can have such a positive impact on all the actions and thoughts and behaviors that you do for the rest of the day. In fact, the very concept of mantras, uh, the power of mantras in, is in its vibrations, right? So in Kundalini Yoga, for example, the chakras actually represent the various energy centers of your body. And each chakra, for those who are aware, is represented by a flower. And each flower has different number of petals, five, six, 10. The Sahasrara chakra has 1,000 petals. And think of these petals as having, is almost like a nerve plexus, where all these nerve endings are there and nerves are co converging. And each of these petals, each of these nerve plexuses, responds to a certain bij mantra, a seed mantra. Different sounds impacting different petals. The muladhara chakra, the base chakra responding to lam. The swadhisthana chakra, the sa sacral chakra responding to vam. These are the sounds. The Manipura chakra, the, the solar plexus chakra, responding to Ram. Anahat, which is the heart chakra, responding to Yam. The Vishuddha, which is the throat chakra, responding to Hum. That's why we do, when we do meditation, there is this concept of doing so Hum meditation, because the Hum responds to the Vishuddha chakra. The Agya chakra, the third eye, that is the Bij mantra for that is Om, the most important one. And then finally, when you come to the Sahasrara chakra, that is the silent mantra, the silence at the end of Om. Can you imagine? I mean, it's so deep, so profound. So when, you, when you're chanting something like Om Namah Shivaya as a mantra, over time, there have been other connotations in terms of maybe a de deification of some of these mantras. But the original concept was the Om actually impacted Om Namah Shivaya. So the Om actually res responded to the Agya Chakra. The Shivaya, Va, actually activated the Swadhisthana chakra, the base sacral chakra, and the ya actually was for the heart or the anaha chakra. So at Ananda, what we do is every morning, we start with these various types of mantras. The Mahamrityunjaya mantra, which is a very powerful mantra for activating and for creating well-being. The Gayatri mantra for actually creating positive energy. And finally, the Durga mantra, which is actually removing all obstacles. And there is a very fine practice and a lifetime of dedication for you to get the tonality of how to chant these mantras. The same mantra not said in the right way with the right three, there are, at a very basic level, there are three levels of tones that you need to chant a mantra with and three levels of stretching and pulling a certain consonant. If you don't, the vibrations are simply not there. So it's very powerful, but if you can make this a part of your investment as a daily practice, the return on that is just immeasurable. So mantra chanting, the second. And the third is actually emotional healing. Now, the manomaya kosha as such is actually a repository of all the mental patterns that we have accumulated over time. And we spoke about that earlier. Whether it is the way you've been brought up, the way you've uh, gained all your life experiences, all of that. Your, everybody has an individual life story, right? And each life story provides you a framework for how you see the world. Maybe you grew up in an environment of scarcity. After you become an adult, you're viewing maybe all consumption as a problem, or alternatively, a question of feeling of there's never enough. It could be either one of these. And if you've grown up with a feeling of having to validate everything that you do, eventually, maybe you're looking at a concept of, I will only be happy when I get an approval of, about something. All of these, we know this happens in our lives. So all of these different mental patterns are actually in yoga called samskaras. Samskaras are things that can either propel you forward or they can hold you back. You can either look at 
everything in life as an opportunity, as many of you have been speaking about today, or you can look at the fact that everything is holding me back, and, and it's, a, it's a challenge. You can forge your own way forward, or you can wait for somebody to guide you, right? So the concept of this emotional healing is that everything, whether it's physical issues, emotional issues, or mental issues, they all have a base in healing of the mind and emotions. So at Ananda, when we are talking about emotional healing, it's a combination of coaching, counseling, psychology, but it's also doing work at a deeper subconscious level. And that can take many different routes. It could be spiritual psychology, it could be hypnotherapy, it could be inner child healing, regression, Reiki, pranic healing, all of these things have to come together to really, really make it work. And the impact is very profound. We're able to use emotional healing of this kind to make an impact on people with physical issues, with chronic pain, with chronic health issues, insomnia, autoimmune issues, right? a whole range of other issues. We are able to use emotional issues to actually tackle emotional problems of long-standing variety, whether it is anxiety or stress, whether it is recurring emotional issues like grief and something like you know, past trauma, or emotional issues to handle mental issues like self-confidence, self-esteem, all of these things. So these are all the ways in which we are addressing the Manomaya Kosha. These are all physical. The last two, and I'll very, very quickly wrap up with that. The inner, the inner kosha, that is not a physical kosha. That's actually a transitionary kosha called the Vigyanmaya kosha. Vigyan, Visesh Gyan, which is clarity of knowledge, that ultimate question about who am I, right? And the way we address that is through Vedantic studies. Today, if I ask you if you've not worked on the physical or the pranamaya kosha or the mental element, if I say, well, who are you? It's a ridiculous then you're finally able to figure out, okay, I can answer this question. So Vedantic studies. And the last kosha, which is the innermost kosha, is called the Anandamaya kosha. Ananda, which means bliss, so an the bliss body. And we've pegged our very name to that, so it's a very high responsibility. But yogis have said that you can't develop this. You can only experience it. Once you touch the Anandamaya kosha, you experience bliss. So it's a journey. But there are certain things that we can do to move you along and help you reach that path. The first is seva. Seva is the concept of completely thinking only about the well-being of others before you think about your own well-being. It's that connection, right? And the second is bhakti. Bhakti is the concept of complete devotion and surrender to a cosmic connectedness. And we can see it, like you know, in India, we'll see people who are involved in kirtans or bhajans. These are bhakti devotional singing. And they'll, you'll be watching somebody and they'll be singing and tears will be flowing down their eyes. And they're lost and you ask them later on saying, what happened, was it the music? And they say, no, it's not the music, it's music was only a vehicle. What we are feeling is this feeling of incredible intense love towards everything around you and everything that you know which is connected with you. And that's a very, very powerful feeling. So that's the Anandamaya Kosha and that's, that's the goal, that's, the, that's where you're trying to reach. What a healing retreat needs to do is work your way, and it's the intention, the education of moving somebody along this journey, that's the important part. Um, that's the structure, the construct that I wanted to share with you. I hope you found that interesting, and thank you for being a attentive audience. <laughs>